Well, I think we started. So let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless our time together. I thank you for all those who will be coming today. <clears throat> I ask you to be with us. And as we study Romans, uh, may, may we learn more about who we are in Christ, who Jesus is, and um, who he's not. And how how you designed this um, believer's life to, um, to operate. And I thank you for that. And I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So last time we were we were in Romans 1.1. 1, 1, and I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So it'll be a little bit of an overlap. Um, but there's so much. And I, I want to make sure that we, we get it all. Um, when um, Paul writes in, in Romans... 1 1. Let me get down to my text here. He writes this. And as we go through, we're going to emphasize different parts of this. Hi. Um, hey, Jennifer. It's good to see you. Happy day after Christmas. Hey, Gary. Happy day after Christmas. Um, <coughs> So he writes, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated by the gospel of God. Now, we looked at Paul, just that first word, five pages of my um, text in, in my, um, that I write for these commentaries. And we learned some things about that. <clears throat> Here we're going to look at the word bondservant. So when you think about my opening a letter and... And you're writing to people who have never met you, may have heard about who you are, but never met who you are, who you are, and so they don't have any preconceived notions, really, about you. <clears throat> it's important how you start it, how how you frame yourself, and, and how you're going to present yourself to these people. So there's millions of ways that Paul could have addressed himself, but he chooses to say, "I am a bond servant." of Jesus Christ. And so we talked about last time that in in that time in the Roman Empire, something like 80 or 90 percent of the people had uh, served as slaves or bond servants at one time or another. It wasn't seen, it didn't seem to be a good thing um, to, to present yourself as, but that's how he does it. And also, uh, he says something about how how he views himself. So, so I, I, I talked last time about if someone asked you about who you were, you might say, well, I'm an American, or if you live in Texas, I'm a Texan, or, or, or something like that. <clears throat> well, Paul had several citizenships. <clears throat> he was a Roman citizen. He was also a ci citizen of the nation of Israel. Then he was born again. And when he was born again, when that happened to him, he came to understand that he was now a citizen of a higher kingdom. And this is important for us because if you're born again, hey, David, good to see you. Um, if you're born again, then you're also a citizen of this higher kingdom, higher than whatever nation um, you, you live in or were born into. Or even your uh, your heritage, like German or or, or uh, African or whatever it is, and so, um, so later Paul is going to write a letter to the Philippians, and he's going to say this: Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may conform to his glorious body. Talking about the transformation of a physical body to a, an eternal spiritual body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So, so nothing is outside of his scope. Right? But, but the important part there is our citizenship is in heaven. And when he wrote to the to the Christians in Ephesus, he also wrote something similar to this when he said this in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. 
He says, now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. Remember, saints are live Christian human beings, not dead people that have passed some kind of committee meeting and got, gotten the title of saints given to them by other mere humans. Saints means born-again people, believers. He says, now you're no longer, no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in which the whole building, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in which you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. We, we visited with some people when we were in Houston recently, and these are long relationships. And, and one of the things I talked about when, when we marveled at how God had connected us, and then we, we participated in that by staying connected, was this concept of, the, of being fitted together. I recognize that God connects us specifically with people, and not always do we follow up on that. But I, I find that to be a holy thing. And so even even coming down to who I stand behind in line in the grocery store, God always and forever knew that. So, so I'll strike up a conversation. I'll smile. I'll be a part of someone else's life. And it's because I, I don't really know who he's fitting me together with, but it makes sense to me that that the connections that he arranges will be part of that. Even if it's something like someone visiting in a counseling or discipling room or someone having a cup of coffee with us. And I, I believe that and I practice that. And people that know me know I believe it. Um, now this isn't something that just Paul thought about. Peter, the apostle Peter, also references this idea, this reality. Hi, Lynn. It's good to see you. Happy day after Christmas. Um, in First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10, Peter said this. He says, speaking to us, to believers, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a, a, what? a holy nation. We have citizenship in a nation. A nation is, is everyone who is a citizen. That's why it's important that we have legal citizenship because it, it forms a nation. It forms this, this uh, being that can function in the world of, of a cluster of people, right? We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people for a purpose. That, anytime you see that or so that, it's a purpose statement. He says, so that or that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Hey, Liz, it's good to see you. I hope you're feeling better. Um, and so, so we're citizens. So when Paul says he's a bondservant, and he knows that he's a citizen of Rome, and he's a citizen of Israel, he's saying that that his primary, uh, primary identity is going to have to do with being a bondservant to Jesus Christ. Now, the first century church saw themselves primarily as citizens of heaven. In fact, in the very next verse, in, in 1 Peter 2.11, um, Peter uh, describes Christians as being sojourners and pilgrims on the earth. We're citizens of heaven, not of the world. And Paul is going to say something about that in one of his letters, that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We have been taken from that and are now living as emissaries or citizens of heaven as we go into this foreign place in which our bodies have, have operated. For me, it was 30 years before I was born again. So do we do that? Do we see ourselves first and foremost as citizens of heaven? We either do or we don't. Hi, Andrew Jones in Thailand. It's good to see you. Um, and your bride, I imagine, is there with you. Um, 
do we do that? Do we see ourselves primarily, first and foremost, as citizens of heaven? Well, I'll say this. If we did, we would live that out. We would look more like heaven than we do like the earth. So Paul says, again, um, in and I'm going to paste every verse of this letter if I, if I keep it together. He says this in the first verse of this this book. Uh, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. When Paul told this to fellow Roman citizens, right at the start of his letter, he was making a point. So when he says he's a bondservant and he says this to citizens of Rome, he's making a point that his primary allegiance was going to be to God's kingdom in which he saw himself as a bondservant to the king, Jesus. Now the Greek word for that um, that he uses is D. O-U-L-O-S, doulos. And I'm going to quote the whole paragraph that I have there because I have something out of the Complete Word Study Dictionary. And I, I learn a lot through um, the references that I have here. Um, the Greek word that he uses, doulos, according to the complete word study dictionary means a slave one who is in permanent relation of servitude to another his will being altogether consumed in the will of the other now think about this most romans were very familiar with the idea of slavery something like 90 percent of the roman population had served as a slave for a portion of their lives. They knew one could become a slave by involuntarily being taken captive in war, by being bought, or by being sold. Uh, you can sell yourself into service to settle a debt. But, but that their will was their will in servitude. What is your will? Your will is one of the three parts of, of your soul. You have a thinker, your mind, you have a feeler, your emotions, and we have a decider, our will. Well, the word meant, doulos, that Paul used, is that he was in permanent relation of servitude to Jesus Christ, his will being altogether consumed in the will of Jesus Christ. Needless to say, this was a strange way for an apostle of the Lord to start a letter to the Christians in Rome. Why did he do that? Well, because it was the truth. And, and he wanted to affect them. And he wanted them to begin to see themselves as belonging, as bond servants to Jesus too, and allowing his will to be their will. Now that begs the question, do we even consult him? When we're fixing to do something, do we do we even consider that Jesus might not want us to do something, even good things sometimes? I mean, I never did for a long time. I mean, I, I got involved in a whole bunch of Christian ministry type situations, and they were all good ideas. I just, in retrospect, don't know if he wanted me to do them. They were good things. And generically, I don't think he disagreed with them as generic ideas, but was that what he wanted to spend himself in this body doing? I don't know. I learned, I learned to start asking later and start considering, would the king really want me to do this? So why did Paul start this letter off in a strange way? Because it was his truth, it was the truth, it was how he lived, how he saw himself. Paul and all other Christians, for that matter, pledged 
to be bond servants to Christ by asking him to be our Lord, or the other word for Lord is owner. In our lives, we asked him to own us. We were purchased by Christ, and when we were, he settled our sin debt for paying for it all on the cross. So we sold ourselves into being a bondservant so he would pay our debt. How do we know this? Because the scripture says so. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and if you follow my teachings, you'll see I, I quote this all the time. Because I don't think... Francine, it's good to see you. I'm sorry your husband is in MD Anderson. That can only mean one thing. That can only mean a cancer diagnosis, and I'm sorry to hear that. But you never, nobody ever has to apologize for not going to church, for not listening to Bible studies, for not taking part in Christian gatherings. You don't have to apologize. I appreciate that, but it's understandable. You're here today, and that's a good thing, and it's good to see your name there. We are not obligated to this. We belong to Christ. We don't belong to groups of people. So, so you don't have to apologize for not coming. But I'm always happy to see you, okay? Um, but thank you. Um, this is a verse that I post every time I teach online, every book of the Bible that I ever teach, because I'm conv I know that I wasn't told when I was born again that I no longer belong to myself, that Jesus had purchased me, and I lived as if I still belonged to me, and I'm pretty sure I wasted some good stuff that way. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul says this. Do you not know, and the reason he says that is because most don't. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, literally in our spirits, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? We don't belong to ourselves, and nothing we, quote, own belongs to us. Whatever I have, let's say this cell phone, this is Jesus' cell phone, right? Because I belong to Jesus. The money I'm spending to pay for that thing belongs to Jesus. My life belongs to Jesus. And I prayed and I said, do you want me to spend some of your money on an iPhone? Because I use it as a tool. I work that baby, you know, and... <laughs> But uh, but if, I, if I'd have thought he wanted me to get an Android or I got it, if he wanted me to not have a cell phone, I wouldn't have one. Why? Because I don't belong to myself. He says, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Not G-O-D-S, but G-O-D apostrophe S. We belong to him. When Paul opens his letter the way he does, I'm a bond servant to Christ. He's teaching a truth about all Christians, all believers in relation to Jesus. We are all bond servants to Christ in reality. That's our situation. <clears throat> Whether or not we live that out, well, that's a different issue. There's a lot of us, I already confessed that I didn't for a while, um, for many years. There's a lot of us in the body of Christ that never live as if we belong to Jesus. But we do. How did that happen? We asked him to purchase us when we said, I want you to be my Lord. He was also, Paul was also emphasizing that there are no elevated positions in the kingdom in which there's one king and all the subjects are equally bond servants, even if they have a role like apostle, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, or homemaker, or whatever it is. There are no elevated positions in the new covenant. There's Jesus and the rest of us. I know that's not how it's practiced in the institution, but that's how it's practiced in the scriptures. So even if people who've been graced with the gifts of apostle, or prophet, or pastor, or teacher, or evangelist, or, or like our friend Harlene in, in Houston, who, who has the gift of hospitality, whatever it is, 
if they choose to see them as honorific titles, you know, that supposedly gives you a special anointing, but we don't have that. They're just still fellow bond servants of Christ, or they may serve nobody but themselves. And that is sad. So if I'm a bond servant of Christ and I never serve Christ, how the heck can I harvest the, the, the beautiful benefits that he has built into bond servant? I can't. So we must serve the king if we can be if we're gonna get everything he, he died for us to have and for us to be. So again, Paul Paul says He's a bond servant of Christ, Jesus. And we'll finish uh, verse 1. We're going to know it because we're going to see it like eight times. Um, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And the next thing he says is called to be an apostle. Separated to the gospel of God. Next, Paul was sure the voice to voice the reason he had a right to address the church in Rome as he was about to do. One of the things an apostle does is bring order and teaches and helps people to see what their place is in the body. Note how he puts this. He was called to be an apostle. Now we first see the first apostles in Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. And here we have. And remember, if you're new in the study, if you just popped in, look, just say hi so we'll know you're here. Um, not required, but we appreciate it. Um, and when he had called, when Jesus had called his 12 disciples to, to him, he gave them power of unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. And now all the first ones were named. The names of the 12 apostles are these. Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, Pete, and Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who we know later betrayed him, betrayed Jesus. Now the Greek word, I'm, I'm going to paste this because I'm going to butcher it if I try to say it. Proskaleo. The Greek word for call is this word. Proskaleo. I guess that's how you say it. It means to summon one to oneself for a purpose. And the word apostles is a transliteration of the Greek word apostolos, A-P-O-S-T-O-L-O-S. And it refers to someone being sent for a specific purpose. So he calls for a specific purpose and he sends for a specific purpose. And here in Matthew 10, they're given special abilities and gifts which coincide with their calling as apostles. In Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the exact same word um, for called is used to describe Paul's calling, and the same gifts were uh, released for him, so he was called to be an apostle. The same word was used for apostle, apostolos, proskaleo, for call, um, and, and it's a transliteration of these words, um, which, and it's the same the same words were used to describe him in Romans 1.1 1, 1, that the 12 disciples received. And we can see the evidence of this. And he, he got the same gifts and talents. We can see this in, in, in the book of Acts. So you see him doing those things in the book of Acts. You see Paul doing those things. Hi, Carl. It's good to see you. Um, Carl is an amazing guy. If you ever have a, a question, ask him. Is that okay to say that, Carl? Um, um, I've, I've learned things by watching the things he posts on Facebook. Um, and our meetings, which have 
they've taken too long. It's been a long time since I've eaten a meal with you, Carl. Um, apostles are also mentioned in Ephesians 4.11. And one reads that whole passage in Ephesians 4. It becomes evident that God never directed that there would be a season in which having apostles and prophets would cease to exist in the church. Therefore, I believe there are modern-day apostles. Most, however, are bound by non-biblical denominational restrictions which prohibit apostles from functioning within their ranks. So the order, the miracles, the freedom from demonic oppression, etc., which God intends for apostles to minister never happens in those groups. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Note also, and this is important, that Paul did not ordain himself to be an apostle. As many who decorate themselves with that title do now in the modern church. There's a lot of people out there that are just being, I'm an apostle, and they proclaim themselves to be an apostle. Um, most of those aren't doing anything apostolic whatsoever. They just believe that it somehow gives them, um, I don't know, more stroke. It makes, and then people that don't know any better fall for that. Um, people should study the scriptures so they don't, they don't get built by these charlatans. Um, this is not Paul's idea. It wasn't Paul's idea to become an apostle. Jesus called him to this taxing role in the church. One with, by the way, which, by the way, would someday cost him his earthly life. One day he's going to die. You know, well he has, but one day he would, he would die because uh, he functioned as an apostle and un, unabashedly so. He went after it. <clears throat> My point is that being an apostle is not meant to be for the benefit of the one who is the apostle. An apostle is there for God and to spend himself for his fellow believers. They bring order to the church. Hey, Joe Yarborough, it's good to see you. Um, the same is true for pastors and prophets and teachers and, and evangelists spend themselves for the lost. That's just the way it is. If we have a role in the body of Christ, and there's a title for it, it's not there to make you feel better about yourself or to elevate yourself above other people. It's there. It's going to cost. It's there for the service of your fellow believers and God, of course. When Paul used it, he was using it in that third sense. He had been selected by God to administer the gospel of God. So he, he added another element. Basically, the word separated means to define a person. He was separated to the gospel of God. It was used in the Greek to refer to separating oneself from one place to go to another, for example. Or to, so like if, if I left here and I went home, I'm using that word to separate myself from my office to go to my home. Um, it was used um, to separate um let me see, I lost. To describe a person being rejected from a group. So if you get this fellowship to somebody who doesn't like you anymore and they kick you out, you've been separated. Or it's used to describe a person who has been selected for an office or a task. Not, not, it's not a promotion. It's just a, a removal from the group for a purpose. My, when Paul used it, he used it in a third sense. He had been selected by God to administer the gospel of God. It's curious that the Pharisees, a sect to which Paul belonged prior to his conversion, used a version of the Greek word translated as separated to describe themselves. They literally saw themselves as the separated ones. Separate from the other Levitical priests known as Sadducees, but in their minds, more importantly, separated from and in their minds superior to the other Jewish people. And I don't think the Lord intended that. I don't believe God ever intends this for his people. I know he doesn't intend it for the new covenant church, for the church. 
when people when people are functioning in a role god doesn't look at them and go goes he doesn't say well they're superior because they have that title the people the same price was spent to redeem them as all the other people um so here we have a man who is arrogantly this guy paul who is arrogantly separated as a pharisee now separated from them so the second one he was cast out right to attend to attend to a mission that god call, caused that god gave him that caused his former peers to despise him because now he was a believer and functioning as an apostle for Jesus. In the modern day church, people use the term called to the ministry or separated to the gospel all the time. And it's as if they're saying they're leaving normal life to live a more elevated calling. People tend to treat them differently. <laughs> Paul, well, he kept making tents for a living. Somewhere between 65 AD and now, that notion of being separate, good to hear you too, Tom. Thank you for letting us know you're here. Somewhere between 65 AD and now, that notion of being separated from ministry has caused the church to devolve into what it is today. Not evolve, not a, a rising up, but a, a going downward, a devolution, a devolving into what it is today. Now we have something that God never intended for his church, a separation of his children into the two religious classes of laity and clergy. Clergy being the important folks that stand on the stage and laity. Now I know people that do that, and that's what they, they, they work. And they, they have congregations and they certainly don't consider themselves to be superior. I have friends that are ministers that don't. But a lot of the people in the congregations do. And, um, and some connect this to the Roman Catholic Church. But really it's the same spirit at work that caused the Pharisees and Sadducees to consider themselves separate from other people just like them. And it led them to, to feeling superior to the other people who were just like them, except they didn't have the same tasks to do for God. So that, that spirit goes all the way back to prior to Christ. Today, the extra biblical clergy often communicates this by working on an elevated platform. And that places them to, uh, somewhere between two and five feet higher than everybody else, um, wearing special uniforms that might be vestments, you know, the, the priestly robes. It could be expensive suits or some other clothing, uh, insisting on being a, 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 a special titles. I was at a retreat once, and I listened to these three guys debate about what was their proper title in their denomination. I mean, the... the the form was more important to them than the reality of what they got to do on behalf of the Lord. I want to be called parson. I want to be called pastor. I want to be called reverend. I want to be called, jeez. I was just so disheartened by that. Uh, it could mean better housing. Some of the, some of the people that are, are in ministry insist on um, better housing. Some of them even demand People pay them to go speak someplace. They demand an honorarium. Sometimes they tell the people what they're going to pay to hear them speak. They put them up in exp They demand that they be put up in host expensive hotels. Provide limousine service to venues. I don't get it. I really don't. I don't know why anybody falls for that. I don't know how anybody could do that with a straight face. You know, if someone invites you to go speak someplace, it's an honor. That's enough. You know, if they want to hear what you have to say, what amazing, what an amazing blessing that is. Well, you know, why, why crack the whip on them and demand, you know, give me, I want caviar, you know, this kind of junk. I think it's ridiculous. Um, Paul made tents. He worked for, uh, for a living. And he fulfilled his calling humbly. 
And then there's this other matter. There's the matter of recognizing the fact that all Christians have been separated for the gospel or some other role in the body of Christ. Every one of us, every born again person has something that he, he has picked us to do. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, so if you're born again, when you confess Jesus as your Lord, the Holy Spirit places you, baptizes you into Christ, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Bonsoir, Marie Chagnon. It's good to see you. I uh, wish I could say Merry Christmas in French. Um, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and he has given us a ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us. He's given us something. Joa Noel, did I say that correctly? Francine, this is Marie. Marie, this is Francine. Marie is a retired RN in uh, Quebec. And um, both of y'all speak French. Y'all could have a private message and speak French to each other. <laughs> uh, he, says, he says he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now we are ambassadors for Christ. As though Christ were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We have that. We've been separated to do that. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be putting flyers out under people's um, windshield wipers. It doesn't have to be door knocking. It doesn't have to be going on an evangelistic trip. Those are all good things. Missions, trips, and all that, those are all great things. But you could do this helping somebody out in your neighborhood, you know, or, or coming to sit with someone in the hospital. Oh, Francine, I just realized you were in MD Anderson. We were just in Houston last week. And if I'd have known you were there, I'd have gone to see you. So hopefully, I hope you're still not there in January, but if we try, travel and I'll be in contact with you, okay? Um, Paul was an apostle. Paul had gifts that went with that calling. We each have a gift which goes with our callings the very same way. We are each as important in the kingdom of God as was and as are apostles today. All the gifts and callings believers have come, have come from the very same God. They all have equal value. This means that a housewife, a store manager, a clerk, an apostle, someone who opens a home to shelter others, and on and on can practice these callings and be ministers of reconciliation and ambassadors for Christ simultaneously whatever we do for a living I'll tell you a quick little story so I function in whatever giftings I have I've, I've uh, tried to to do the best I know how to do with it I've tried to read the scripture study learn from other people and, and all this and, and um, 30 years ago I, I connected with a lady that has become like a sister to us in Houston her name is Harleen and uh, Harleen is just a wonderful lady. And, um, and, she, and numerous people have lived at her house. Uh, people that needed a temporary home, people whose apartments were being renovated or houses being renovated or fires, whatever it is, people visiting. And, um, and we were just there and she just gives us a garage door opener and we come and go as we please. She is so, this is her gift, hospitality. And one day we were talking, and I'd come in from one of my late meetings um, with people that I see down in Houston, and and she was talking about what she liked about what she saw and whatever it is I do, and I appreciated that. 
But then she started to cry and she said, I wish I had, I wish I had a gift like yours. And I think this is a common trap that a lot of people fall into is in the body of Christ and outside is comparing ourselves to each other. And, and the reason that I have the gift I have or the reason you have the gift you have is because God said so. Just as simple as that. It's not because anybody is more amazing than anybody else. I certainly don't consider myself to be. Um, but I also am pretty comfortable in what I do now. Um, and I said, why? And she started telling me all this. And, and she said, I don't have any spiritual gifts. And I, I didn't believe that. And I said, I, and I started talking about how comfortable people felt in her home. When she, when she attends a congregation, her home is the one people want to do things in. They want to have dinner parties there. They want to play cards and games there. They want to do all that kind of stuff. And it's because she just exudes hospitality. And that is a valuable spiritual gift. All of these gifts come from the very same God. Whatever your gift is, don't go comparing it to someone else because that's just a waste of time. If you, if you desire a gift, the scripture says to ask for it. And if the Lord wants you to have it, you'll get that. But don't look down on yours because they seem to be more humble than others in the hierarchy that the institutional church seems to organize these things in. They have apostles and prophets up at the top. So often, if, if those are disqualified, <laughs> then um, a, a pastor will be up there. But, but there is no ranking like that. That is all man-made. It's all nothing. It, it has no value whatsoever. Paul said he was a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Some believe Paul received this call when he was saved. They say this because when Paul was born again, God said something to him, to, to a man named Ananias about Paul. And, and, and we see that in Acts 9.15. He says to Ananias, he says, go over there and lay hands on him. He says, um, the guy's blind, go lay hands on him. And he says, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And so he did say that he was chosen. But Paul says something different about it in Galatians chapter 1. It's kind of zooming in on his calling a little bit. He says this, when it pleased God who separated me, that word separated, from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles and did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go to Jerusalem for those, to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and then returned again to Damascus. He says he was separated from his mother's womb and called by God's grace. However, it wasn't until God revealed Jesus to him that he received the call. In this Galatians verse, Paul is basically saying, I was born to share the gospel, the good news of Christ. And the reason that I wrote that, the way I wrote that, is this. And I hope this is encouraging to whoever hears this. I think this is how it is for all people. We do have a purpose built into us by God, by God in our mother's womb. And most people are never born again. They never receive Jesus as Lord. So they never see Jesus for who he really is. And, they, and, and their purpose for him, from him goes unaddressed. And I find that to be incredibly sad. So God builds a purpose in them, in their mother's womb. They don't harvest uh, salvation from the Lord, and therefore that purpose never gets energized. As sad as that is, it's equally exciting to consider that all believers have met Jesus, their purpose has become energized, and it's only a matter of them caring enough to seek Jesus for that 
and then they can walk alongside him satisfying his intentions for their lives. Paul said that he was separated to the gospel of God. What exactly is the gospel of God? And in verses 2 to 6, he's going to give information about the gospel, but the definition is to be found in the translation of the word gospel in the Greek. The word is, and I'm going to paste this, that word gospel and then I'm going to quote it out of the complete Jewish Bible. That word is euagileon. I don't know how you say it. And, and simply means good news. As the complete Jewish Bible puts this verse, from Shual, which is Saul, basically, a slave of the Messiah Yeshua, an emissary because I was called and set apart for the good news of God. The good news, of course, is that Jesus has come to the earth, paid the penalty, which was death, for the sins of all people, and is willing to share the fruit of his work, eternal life, on our behalf with anyone who will receive him as Lord. In John 10.10, 10, he said, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. He says, I came. That they might have life. They may have life and have it abundantly. And in John 10, 27 to 28, he says this. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them that they shall not perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. For hopelessly lost people, weary of trying and failing to make themselves good enough to go to heaven, hearing this truly is good news. And then for the next few verses, and we'll see this next time, Paul will give some additional information about the gospel before returning to his usual pattern of identi identifying his intended first rep recipients of this letter, um, starting in verse 7. And, and we're going to pick up here in verses 1 and 2 next time, and, um, and that's where we'll start next time. So, um, so I hope you had a good Christmas. Francine, I'll be praying for your husband. We're going to pray for him right now. And we're going to close our study for this week. I appreciate you being here with us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for those who take their time to spend with us um, gathering like this in this medium and, and learning about your word. And I, I'm humbled that people would want to do that with us tonight. I ask you to I'll be with anyone who watches these things. Uh, on uh, YouTube and the other places that you can see these videos. I ask that you, you bless us with an understanding that we belong to you and not to ourselves, that uh, there are no elevated positions in the body of Christ, uh, that uh, we have been given, we've been separated for purpose from the world, and that you've commissioned to each of us um, the, the right to re represent you, to bring life and bring the gospel uh, into the lives of other people. And there's a myriad ways to do that. And I ask you to guide us to that. I ask you to she sharpen our ears so we can hear your voice, so we can be directed by you. And I thank you for that. And I praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Father, I ask you to be with Francine and her husband. I don't exactly know what's going on there. Um, Francine, if you want to send, send me a specific prayer request in a, a personal note, on Facebook, then I will send it out to our ministry prayer team. But Father, you know what it is, and you know what season he's in in his life, and your will will be done. So I ask you to um, to bless them, and I thank you for um, giving him a wife that stands by him, and other friends too that I know. I know the group she comes from, and I know there's other people surrounding them. I ask you to bless them, Father, and I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless y'all. 
um, next week, um, uh, we should meet on, uh, well, it's going to be New Year's Day, and I plan to teach, but we'll see how things go. Uh, that's my plan. We'll see what his will is, right? God bless y'all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.